I now have the distinct honor to introduce our keynote speaker this morning, a former campus activist at Trinity College and a community organizer for Project Vote, whose mission was organizing low-income voters throughout the state of Connecticut, a person who, over many years, has dedicated his energies to helping the communities of which he has been a member. Sean is the youngest of six children who grew up in Hartford's North End, a participant in the Project Concern Desegregation Program he, he attended Manchester schools, specifically Waddell Elementary School, then what was Illing Junior High School, and graduated from Manchester High School with honors. <laughs> Sean received a scholarship to attend Trinity College, where he now sits on the Board of Trustees. His law degree is from the New York University School of Law. Sean has worked with nonprofits, labor unions, business leaders, and community activists. The Connecticut Law Tri Tribune has presented Sean with its Community Contributions Award, and he was named one of 25 investment professionals to watch by Pensions and Investment Magazine, and one of Hartford's 40 under 40 business leaders by the Hartford Business Journal. He was also presented with the Alumni Medal of Excellence by Trinity College. <clears throat> Sean has talked about his journey in his conversations with our members and with others. And during his nomination speech, he spoke about a sad thought. I'll quote him. The odds of a kid from the north end of Hartford ending up in a casket are far greater than standing on a stage like this in a night like this. And we must work with him to change that. He also talked about his parents not having a lot financially, but teaching him a lot about values, the value of a good education and the value of hard work. Again, I quote him, they showed me the importance of giving back to my community. They weren't political people. They were civically engaged citizens that cared about their neighbors. Since becoming Connecticut's treasurer, he has worked with CEA, AFT Connecticut, other executive branch leaders and legislators, and in just those few months has achieved a stability for our teacher retirement system that we have long been working for. His elegant solution, as he referenced it in a legislative hearing, overcame obstacles created by the bond covenants of a decade ago while ensuring that we would avoid a fiscal cliff that clearly would have challenged the finances of the state of Connecticut and endangered our teacher retirement system. We owe him a huge debt of gratitude for taking the lead and getting it done. Thank you, Mr. Treasurer. Please, jo Please join me now in welcoming Connecticut State Treasurer, the man who has oversight of over $60 billion in state assets, the Honorable Sean T. Wooden. Please come up. Thank you, Jeff. I uh, actually didn't expect all of that. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, yeah, so Jeff, uh, your kind words, um, your recognition of where we are, uh, and it's tough to start on a somber note, but it's also kind of impo uh, impossible to have a gathering like this and to not think about what's happening in our country, so thank you. Um, I'd also like to thank you, Don Williams, uh, for your great leadership uh, to teachers and to the state of Connecticut over a long period of time. 
uh, and to the entire CEA leadership, I say thank you for your friendship and for your partnership in moving our state forward. Uh, now to all of you, uh, the members of CEA, I say good morning. Good morning. All right. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me here today. It's really nice to have an excuse uh, to be at a casino at 9 a.m. on a weekday. <laughs> In all seriousness, uh, it's great to join you at your sh summer conference and to share a few words. In fact, I'm extremely honored to address you this year. And let me say from the very beginning, I support you. The hard work you do every day, the strength you bring to the classroom, the minds you are shaping, and the promise of what we are working on together. And I will continue to stand with you. <laughs> Education has long been seen as the most effective catalyst for change. It provides the fundamentals to understand our history and the tools to chart a path forward. The importance of that connection is the hallmark of our democracy. President Johnson began a collaboration 54 years ago to root out ignorance in order to grow our nation and educate its people. When he signed into law the Elementary and Secondary Education Act in 1965, he helped transform American education. Signing the act in the schoolhouse he attended as a kid, he said, and I quote, I felt a very strong desire to go back to the beginnings of my education, to be reminded of that magic time when the world of learning began to open before our eyes. When he signed the act, President Johnson said, and he, he was a teacher before going into politics, and I paraphrase, we bridge the gap between helplessness and hope. We strengthen state and local agencies which bear the burden and the challenge of a better education. And we rekindle the revolution, the revolution of the spirit against tyranny of ignorance. My friends, as educators, you are fulfilling those noble words that Pre President Johnson proclaimed so many years ago. Now, it's not lost on me that since being elected state treasurer, I've had a few moments where I felt I've come full circle. I began my career 21 years ago working as an investment lawyer in the private sector focused on public pensions. Now, here I am as treasurer, sitting on the other side of the table, overseeing public pension plans and managing our state's credit card. It is truly a public service opportunity that I cherish. In the last eight months, there have been a number of major changes in Connecticut state leadership. And with those changes have come a fresh perspective and a renewed focus on some of the biggest challenges facing our state. And so far, we seem to be making some progress. Connecticut's economy is showing signs of growth. The state's budget reserves are on track to grow to historic levels and there are new strong fiscal controls on budgeting and bonding. Twice in four months, Connecticut's credit outlook has improved, and we've set new records selling bonds and attracting investors to purchase over $1 billion in new bonds at significantly lower interest rates. As a result, we've saved taxpayers millions of dollars in long-term interest payments. These are positive signals that investors see Connecticut moving in the right direction. But a few months of positive news should not give us cause to celebrate just yet. Working with key stakeholders, we are focusing on the priorities critical to moving our state forward for the long term. And that brings me to a good story that many of you care a great deal about. One of my highest priorities upon taking the oath of office in January was to ensure the long-term viability of the Teachers Retirement Fund. This was a very personal challenge for me. 
I have always believed that the state has a duty to honor our commitments to teachers, to workers, and to taxpayers. And I'm especially grateful to the many teachers who've helped me become the person I am today. From Hartford Public School System, where I got my start, to my days in the Manchester Public School System as part of a desegregation busing program, and then to Trinity College and later NYU Law. I wouldn't be standing before you today were it not for the many teachers who both challenged and inspired me. It's what President Johnson referred to as the magic in what you do. So I can very confidently say that many of the issues that are important to you are very important to me. And perhaps one thing that mattered most this past legislative session was my proposal to restructure the Teachers Retirement Fund in order to make it more stable and sustainable in the long term. As you know, the state's unfunded pension liabilities affect every taxpayer in our state because the state is required to fund what is necessary to keep the pension plan healthy. And we all need those contributions so that we can invest them in the market and make them grow. After all, the more we invest and the better we invest today, the less taxpayers will have to pay tomorrow. For decades, though, the necessity of full and consistent funding was lost on those at the state capitol. As a result, the funding of the Teachers Retirement Fund grew worse, and in order to catch up, the required annual payments increased steadily. Well, we created a plan that not only strengthens your pension fund, but in a broader sense, represents a roadmap for Connecticut's fiscal future and stability. So many of you may wonder, how did we get here? Well, you'd have to go back to the 1950s when public school teachers decided to opt out of joining Social Security and created their own independent system. Over the next 25 years or so, the state paid retirement benefits out of each year's state budget on a pay-as-you-go system. That led to another plan in the late 70s that covered benefits and paid down the unfunded liability based on an actuarial valuation. And this is where today's situation really began to decline because politicians got into the very bad habit of paying less into the fund than was required by the valuation. And state leaders decided year after year that they would rather spend the state's required pension contributions on other things. So the system sputtered along for the next three decades, and that's how the unfunded liability got so out of control. In 2008, the state decided it needed to finally address the problem, but by then, the problem was so bad that the state had to borrow $2 billion through pension obligation bonds in an effort to boost the fund and reduce the unfunded liability. And that plan might have worked. However, the market collapsed in 2008, devastating the fund. That's when years of backloading or big balloon payments caught up to us, and the state faced huge spikes in future payments. And that's where the teachers fund restructuring proposal comes in, because we had to take action. Under the structure that existed before the proposal was adopted, required annual payments into the pension were projected to peak in 2032 at more than 3.4 billion that year. That level of payment would have crippled the state budget and was simply not realistic. The proposal I created with the governor reamortized the payment schedule of 13 billion in unfunded liabilities extended it over 17 years. This plan allowed the state to keep its commitment to teachers while also restructuring state payments into the fund in a way that is more sustainable in the long term for our taxpayers and our budget. This will now save the state an estimated 900 million over the next five years. In layman's terms, it's really like refinancing your mortgage where you pay more over a longer period of time this now makes the state's annual contributions more stable 
and even while smoothing out gains and losses over time, putting the state on a more sustainable path towards funding the pension fund while maintaining fiscal responsibility. The plan also lowered the assumed rate of return on our investments in the pension fund from 8% to 6.9%, which is a much more realistic and conservative estimate of where experts expect investments will perform in the future. This change also increases the amount the state will have to contribute to the fund annually. The proposal also modifies the amortization methodology, replacing the funding method that backloaded costs you know, those balloon payments that everyone dreads, with an approach that is more sensible for budgeting. So looking back, what we did was put a new perspective on an old problem that we could no longer afford to ignore, with the caveat that we had to do three things. One, honor our commitments. Two, develop long-term stability. And three, create a well-funded pension system. It's that fiscally prudent approach that helped lead to upgrades in our bond rating outlook for the first time in nearly two decades. Now, I've heard some concern about the possibility of the state switching all pensions to defined contribution models, including the pensions of those who have already retired. Let me make it very clear. This is not something that I would ever support. <laughs> Furthermore, I can tell you this would be extremely difficult from a legal standpoint to make any changes to the benefits of retirees. And shifting to a defined contribution plan for everyone in the system would make it nearly impossible to fund the benefits that are already being paid out. We cannot allow that to happen. A profession as noble as teaching deserves retirement security. Now, and I cannot emphasize this enough, there is so much more work that we have to do together. Because while many years have passed since President Johnson began his, began his war on poverty and signed the Education Act, a report came out just last week. It shows a 30% increase in children living in concentrated poverty in Connecticut. As teachers, I know many of you see this every day. Perhaps no other profession today has the challenge of attracting and recruiting good talent as does teaching. And that noble calling to teach also comes with a price. Nationally, teachers spend a billion and a half dollars of your own money on back to school supplies. And teachers in high poverty districts spend $150 more a year on average. Connecticut teachers spend between $500 and $1,500 annually. As is often the case where parents are just financially unable to provide the necessities, teachers fill the gap and provide for them. There is no question that as career teachers, you are fulfilling the highest calling in public service. It's because of your great talent, the years of experience you offer, and your dedication that a new study issued last week reported that Connecticut education systems are among the best in the nation. Thank you. So it's time we fo focus on drawing the best talent to the profession and ensure that teaching is made more secure as we go forward, not back, never back. As I shared earlier, I was a student of desegregation Growing up in North Hartford, I took multiple Connecticut transit buses, two hours each way, to attend schools in Manchester. Suffice it to say that as a kid, this was really hard. That experience of my parents seeking a better educational opportunity for me 
being exposed to other communities, encountering different opinions, and yes, being subject to prejudices, help shape who I am, why I do what I do, and the value I place on education. The truth is that most kids in my neighborhood in North Hartford are not investment lawyers and don't stand on stages like this. Simply put, a quality education with teachers who believed in my potential changed the trajectory of my life. What you do is truly special, or as LBJ would say, magical. Your instruction, your kindness, your patience, your inspiration, and the faith in the next generation can change lives. So for everything you do, in the many thousands of students you have shared your magic with, in the future generation that awaits your magic, I say thank you. Thank you. Thank you.